you. Hello, good morning, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us bright and early, 9 a.m. in, uh, 10 a.m., excuse me, in Detroit. And thank you so much to our viewers who are catching the live stream as well. I know we have a lot of um, international viewers and people from all over the country, so we really, really appreciate it. And we want to welcome you to this session uh, from DHL to Green Card. I'm uh, Angelica Durrell. I have the pleasure of being the CEO and founder of Intempo in Stanford, Connecticut. We work with immigrant children, so that's, I believe, why I was asked to be a moderator today. I am an immigrant myself, originally from Ecuador. And although I did not have uh, a student visa, per se, because uh, I came here very young as a, as a child, m uh, one of my family members, who's a researcher, did get his visa and his green card through the O-1 um, visa for talent and incredible, you know, intellect. So I'm really, really proud of, of that. But we have a wonderful panelist, and I just want to start off with um, the person that recommended this panel, and she's going to tell us a little bit about herself as well. Yeah. Uh, good morning. My name is Andrea Restrepo, Andrea de Pilar Restrepo. I am from Colombia, from a city uh, called Ibagué, which is, the, is known as the uh, city of music of Colombia. Uh, currently, I work for the Empire State Youth Orchestra, which has sponsored my work visa, H-1B, and my extension, and currently they are sponsoring my green card. Um, and I also want to say hello to the people who are watching the live stream, but I want to do it in Spanish, because I invite many of them in Colombia. So, buenos dias, la gente que está viendo el live stream desde Colombia o de otra parte del mundo, eh, a las 10 de la mañana, un sábado. Y bueno, muchas gracias por estar ahí. Eh, también quería recordarles que hay en, la, en, la, en la aplicación hay una opción para uh, poner los captions en, en español, si no hablan inglés. Entonces, y también decirle hola a mi mamá, está ahí, mirando, creo, eh, de pronto. Ok, eh, quería preguntarle a la gente que está en la audiencia si tienen alguna idea por qué... Ah, I'm sorry, English. Ok. <laughs> I forgot. Ok, uh, people in the audience, uh, do, you, do you have an idea as to why I named this session DHL, from DHL to Green Card? If you don't know, just raise your hand or just like, why or guess? Why, oh, no guess. Ok, somebody, yes? Uh, you can, the white, um, in white, what do you think I named that? It's being slow when you get your visa, and then uh, you have to go and like, pick it up or something, and then oh. I have to do it. So. Ah, okay, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then yeah. Oh, exactly. So, um, so DHL is the shipping company, and well, the story is, I just, when I was thinking about this session, I thought, um, the first thing that I got, what was the first document? The first document that I got was my I-20. I-20 is the document that you need, that you re received from the international office of uh, whatever university you apply for. And then uh, you get that um, email from the international office that says that your uh, I-20 is in the mail and they send you a tracking number. And in my case, it was through DHL. So they send it and I was very, eager checking every day where it was because that was very important for me. So then, anyway, you take it to the embassy and then maybe you get your F1 visa, student visa. So that's the reason why I named it from DHL to Green Card. Uh, and we all know the sense of pride that you get when you receive an acceptance letter and even more so an international student who wants to pursue their dreams in the US. Uh, so that's exactly why. And there are many embassy visits in between all these visas, and then maybe finally a green card or, a, or citizenship. And all of these are nerve-wracking, anxiety-inducing, mentally exhausting experiences, but always they are accompanied by hope that the outcome will be positive, we hope. And then, well, this session uh, seeks to spotlight this journey and explain some of the steps required uh, for international musicians and administrators to obtain a visa, a green card, maybe. And so I invite you to engage in this discussion on how we can collectively uh, address and bridge this learning process uh, so that the path is smoother for the upcoming international uh, musician and professional. So I welcome you to join the discussion. Thank you.
Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. And I want to uh, just remind everybody or the people that are also watching, you can ask questions via Slido, or you can also scan this QR code, and it takes you to the Sphinx app to a separate page to, so you can ask the questions. We are also going to make this interactive, and you will be able to go up to the mic and ask us questions. And we don't have, you don't have to wait until the end. We want this to be a fluid conversation. So if you have a reaction or a question, as one of us is speaking or after something was said, uh, please feel free to come to the stage. I also want to ask, by show of hands, do we have a lot of students here, international students in the audience? OK, great. Yeah. Do we have uh, presenters or hosting organizations for international students or artists? OK, okay great. Do we have potential employers who are interested or considering hiring international um, students that need visas and want to do Great, wonderful. Um, I am on that lit line uh, section of how do I hire someone and sponsor them for, for a visa. And that's why we have a lawyer that will be with us um, explaining this process to us. So um, Brian, if you don't mind, can we start with Roberto because you have a slideshow and then, sure. and then you'll go into your slideshow. So let's go with our next, uh, next panelist. Good morning, my name is Roberto Arruda. I am uh, currently, I am Director of International Student Services and Study Abroad at Berklee College of Music. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't that tell if that was a sigh or... No, that was good. Oh, that was good. Yeah, I yeah, guarantee. It was kind of like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I am also an immigrant. I came from Brazil. I like to say I'm from the South. Yeah. Um, so I came from Brazil. Uh, in my case, it wasn't DHL, it was a FedEx envelope. Okay. envelope. <laughs> and it, it's so exciting to get that envelope. You know, yes. all of a sudden you have this document that starts to open doors for you, that's what you think at least. Um, so I, I came to the US uh, to get a master's degree and uh, that's how I started my higher ed journey as an international student myself. And um, you know, my career ended up moving through different uh, areas in higher education from teaching to administration and that's where I am right now. Um, it's it's a, an incredible journey for anybody who is taking it. It's so exciting to see so many students here. Um, I understand what it's like to be in this position, even though it's been a while. So if you're currently a student, your experience might be slightly different from what I experienced back pre-pandemic and pre a lot of things. Um, but I admire the courage and the effort, that the commitment that you're putting into all of this. Uh, it's, it's a lot of work. So I'm, I'm excited to be here talking to you uh, from this administrative perspective today uh, and also sharing a little bit about my experience as well. And thank you, Andrea, for proposing this. I think this is an, an incredible idea. Oh, thank, you. thank you, Roberto. Uh, Brian, please uh, introduce yourself and enlighten us with your presentation. Sure, <laughs> hi. Um, uh, Brian, I always hate the, the moniker lawyer because I hate lawyers. But um, uh, you can we have a, a, my bio is in the app, so you can find that really briefly. Um, uh, we have a, a, a small boutique performing arts law firm in New York City. We only work with artists, uh, which means we only do about 1% law, 99% is mostly therapy and all that kind of stuff, um, including a lot of international work with uh, students and visas and doing that transition from F to O. And it, as they've alluded, it is an insane and crazy process it always has been. They ratchet it, ratchet it up with the insanity every now and then, but it's it's pretty stupid from its very core. So hopefully, I'm going to try and just give you an overview uh, based on some of the misperceptions that we hear sometimes. And you know, everybody gets information from friends and colleagues. So just mostly ignore all of that because it's almost always wrong. Um, so let's just, I just want to delve down into this, um, cause it is scary. It's sort of like a colonoscopy, but the more you know about it to prepare, we're all going to have to go through it at some point. So let's just, you know, bend over and take it. Okay. So, um, th there are very, many, many types of visas, but addressing most of you who I presume will want to get a trans, uh, transfer from F to some kind of work <laughs> opportunity, uh, you're primarily looking at O's, P's, or P3. Um, there are subtleties within there, but the idea is the O is for an individual performing artist. And it doesn't have to be a performing artist. It can be a designer. You can be an arts manager. You can be something that involves a modicum of creativity. You do not have to be the one 
on the stage. P1 is for a group. There, there's one little minor exception if you're joining an orchestra, but we can always get to that later. There's P3, which attracts a lot of people, but don't get attracted to it because this is the US government where nothing is going to be like you think it should be or make sense. P3 is culture unique, but does not mean culture the way we would. Well, it is culture, but they think of it more as sort of indigenous or tribal. So for example, if you have world music, that's not cultural. If you have uh, music that, con that combines or things that combine different cultures and art forms, that's not cultural either. Um, we can delve into that. But primarily, especially if you're a student looking to move in um, and go on with your career, you're probably going to look at O. There are other little things down there, the, the H's and stuff, but they rarely apply to the arts. Sometimes in narrow, narrow circumstances we can get into, but the moment somebody says H1B, it's got to be very, very specific circumstances. You're mostly going to be looking at O's. So <clears throat> what does that mean? Um, there are two parts to the visa. It's, first, it starts with a visa petition that is filed with USCIS, part of Homeland Security. We'll talk about that. And then the consulate comes later, which is part of the State Department. OK, there's two parts to everything. Do you qualify for the O? We're just going to focus on O's, because it's mostly going to be parallel to the others. And how long do you get? There are no automatic people will call and say, I want the, the, the three-year visa. No such thing. Um, it's possible, but it doesn't work like that. So first thing, do you meet the requirements? <clears throat> O-1 visa, do not get scared. This is government speak. It's basically, it's very, very subjective. And it's highly dependent on the officer that gets the, the petition. And bear with me, because nothing again is how it seems we're going into this sort of mirror world of, oh my god. Um, they basically have these six things. You pick two, or no, you pick three, and not all of them are going to apply. Um, this is all a very one-size-fits-all for everything from pop stars to, I, I had, um, um, I don't have a lot of time for war stories, but I had an approved O-1 uh, violist just last week who went to the consulate um, in Chile, I think it was, and was refused the visa because the guy at the, 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 the little uh, consular officer looked him up and said, you don't have, a, you don't have a, um, a, um Instagram page. And all famous artists have Instagram pages, and you don't have one. And how can you be a famous artist if you're not Instagram? It's like, I'm a violist. I barely can, you know, I can't even get a job. Um, so, uh, so he basically denied it, saying you can't be famous enough if you're not on Instagram. Completely wrong. We'll take care of it. But it's, you know, that's a little heads up here. So you pick two or three of these things. I'm going to delve into this later. And you have to provide proof of these things. The other part of the petition is how long you get. The O-1 can be valid, or any of these, well, the O-1 can be valid up to three, a P, lesser times. The important takeaway is that the actual classification is determined by the number of engagements. These are employment-based visas. So you have, if you have one engagement, you'll get a visa for uh, uh, one month. It brings it on. And we have a question, which I love, fine, because otherwise I'll just ramble until someone tells me to stop. visa? No, never. No, 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 no. And that's a great question. First of all, we use the word petition because sponsor is more of a family thing. The, the organization, this has nothing to do about your organization. You can have a tiny little organization. They're not looking at that. And it's a great question because I'll tell you what they are looking for. They're not interested in, it's if you're going to work for the Met or something, that's interesting. But they don't know any of these organizations. So they don't know how big or small you are. They don't care how big or small you are. They don't care what you do. Totally not interested in that. Um, this is because they are, and here's what gets into it. Here's where I need you to set aside your own headspace for a moment. So the visa petitions are approved by United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. It's part of the Department of Homeland Security, and it is insane. Um, like I learned in theater, you need to know your audience. This is who is going to be reviewing your petition. These examiners have never been to a concert. They have no familiarity with the arts. They have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. So this is why the most frustration comes from people preparing petitions for the wrong audience. They don't know or care who you studied with. They don't know or care what your repertoire is. They don't know or care how beneficial you are to the, to the cultural exchange, blah, 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 could care less. Have you been on TV? Have you on Instagram? This is their perspective. They're incredibly paranoid. 
and they are convinced that everyone has spent their entire life going through conservatories simply to come into the U.S. and bring us health care. This is exactly, they are absolutely convinced you're all lying. So, big thing, artists' visas are not based on talent. You can have an award for being the world's worst artist. They're fine with that. You can have articles saying, oh my God, he stunk. Fine with that. They're looking for attention. They're looking for um, what have you done to give yourself uh, notoriety in the real world. So that does not mean what impresses a professor. It means what impresses this dumbass. So um, they're not interested. We, when we put in a petition for a student, we don't put in where they go to school. We don't put in degree. They hate that because they really hate students. Absolutely hate them. And here's why. The presumption is when you guys get that I-20 and you get that F, you're coming into the U.S. for a tiny period of time to, from some country, you know, that has absolutely nothing. You, you suck us dry. You go back and tell all of your friends how wonderful we are and you never return. The presumption is you do not want to stay. So when they see a student who now is graduated and wants to go to an O-1, they go, well, what? Did you lie when you come in? Did you actually mean to have a career here? Okay. All that means is you need to know that and have as many, and the thing that bothers me the most is they never give this lecture to the students when they first come. They wait till after they graduate to find out they've all done the wrong things, like get a doctorate or something. Um, they don't want that. They don't, they're not impressed by education. They're not impressed by anything you've done. They want to see, have you performed somewhere? Have people written about you? Have people said, oh my God, they're great. Oh my God, they stink. It's attention they want. Not quality, not ability, not how much you bring in, not how much that you value to the world and, and bring in rainbows. They all just want to know, what have you gotten that makes you distinctive as opposed to somebody else? Um, they do not like, do not please fall into the mistake of saying, I gave them 16 reference letters. They do not want those. They hate those, especially if they come from professors or mentors who are giving you all references saying, oh my God, they're great. What they want is, if you want to give them letters, they want a letter that says, hi, I'm a very famous person, and I have, n have no familiarity with this person as a student. Two, I know them because I've performed with them, I've heard them. Three, let me tell you why they're not lying. Yes, they performed here. Yes, that's important. Yes, this, ha this is an award people covet and really are important about. They're just looking for your experts to convince them you're not lying. Yes, sir. Hi, thank you. Even though this experience is abroad in another country, that helps or? Oh, no, they love that. The most stuff you can do outside the US is brilliant. We've had situations where I've had, I again, don't have time for all the stories, but the, um, I, we've sent students outside the US to say, look, go do some dumb thing in Germany. Um, because you can't go anywhere in Germany without finding a classical music festival. And, and anything not in English has to be translated. So you can do the translations yourself, and this can be, oh, I went to Germany's most, most important German thing, and I'm gonna translate this for you, and it's gonna say the most important German thing. And oh, I won a little competition that is for nine-year-olds, but I'm gonna translate that, and oh, there's the Habsburg seal, which makes it look really impressive. Um, that's what they're looking for. And the more you can do outside, it's a great question, because the more you can do outside the US, the more you're showing them you don't want to be here, which is what they want. If it's all about the US, they go, oh, you snuck in, and oh my god, and maybe you're trying to stay. So international stuff is really important. Um, so that's, yeah, that, absolutely, absolutely. Newspaper articles should be uh, translated? Oh, uh, they don't, they will not look at anything online. They won't look at anything digital. They will not look at websites. They will not look at videos. Everything has to be printed out, waste as much paper as you can, and you print it all out. Everything has to be translated, but you can do it yourself. You do not need to go to the UN. You just find yourself or a friend, and they say, I speak, you know, I can speak Spanish and English here. This is what this means. And then it's up to you to go, you know, uh, you know internationally well-known. That's what this word means. And, and, and best and famous, and that's what that word means. So yeah, no, you have to translate because they barely can speak English, let alone read other languages. <laughs> they don't even know where other countries are located. And you know, I'll have to say, this is Spain and it's a picture and it's another country. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, what do they want? I'm trying to speed through this so we're not spending too much time on this, but we can go back. But they want 
programs from play, you literally go through your bio and go, what's my most important stuff and how do I prove it? Okay, I performed at Aspen. Here's a copy of the program with my name in it. Here's a Wikipedia page on Aspen. Next point, I performed at Ravinia. I performed at the Music for I, wherever you guys wind up. Or again, not, it's not only performing artists. It could be you interned at the Met, or here's just proof. And then background, they do not know where Carnegie Hall is. They do not know what the Met is. They do the questions that I have gotten from them over the years would blow your mind. We won't go into them, but they know nothing. So um, you, they want proof of awards. I'm trying to read over my thing. I don't have my notes here. Um, they've got proof of that. They want, um, uh, if, they, if you have an award, that's another important thing. Scholarships, grants do not count as awards um, because they think anything in school is amateur. So if it's you know, the, the Yale Orchestra, no good. If it is the Manhattan School of Music Ensemble, no good. However, if you manipulate all these things, which is really what this is about, is going backwards. It can be anything you want. It's just you can't go in the front door. If you have a Grammy, that's great, as long as you give them a Wikipedia page on that. Um, <laughs> although I did have one time, one, somebody said getting nominated was not the same thing as winning, so that was no good, but we got over that. Um, but they want copies of your articles. They want your awards. If you've got recordings, they want proof that people have listened to them. They don't have to like them. This is, again, the least thing they are concerned about are you guys being any good. Um, petitions. As I said before, examiners are obsessed by fraud. The number one thing, I mean, they do a lot of stupid stuff, but a lot of times when I'm dealing with a uh, denial or something, it's because the petitioner didn't put it together well. They put it together as if it was for a scholarship or a grant application, very different audience. Um, so you want to put in things, they want third party evidence. So this is another thing, is you can't have, if you're being hired by the St. Louis Symphony or the Detroit Symphony, they can't also say how good you are because they think that's biased. And they won't take references from teachers because they figured they taught you, so they're biased. They are obsessed with fraud. So you get third party anything. The thing is, the third party doesn't have to know what they're talking about, it just needs to be a third party. Mm -hmm. um, they want an article that talks about you, not just lists your name. You can use that to prove you were there, but they want an adjective, even if it's a bad one. Um, the thing is that you want to go for achievements that look good as opposed to really being are good. I have a lot, especially in New York, I will always tell the conservatory students, go sign up to be a sub uh, or a cover for one of the Broadway orchestras. They love that. They will find that much more impressive than being with the LA Phil. They'll go, oh my god, that's wicked. They really, I know, some of this is shocking, but they, they, they literally, you are trying to imagine this is an audience that watches reality TV and maybe does teeny little bit of arts people, but they don't understand you at all. Um, one of the things I had mentioned on here, so which is why your question was great, the more non-US material is better. Um, they really, really like that. Um, <clears throat> this is the process in 12 easy steps. You need a petitioner. Anyone can be the petitioner. It does not have to be a multi-big organization. It can be very small. Um, it can be an individual who is hiring you to, engaging you to work with them on a collaborative project. It can be, I have a lot of students who just hire each other. Uh, we walk through, oh, you're going to perform with me and do a recital. Oh, you're going to perform with me and we're going to work on this great thing. And oh my god, it's really wonderful. Again, they're very literal. Anal, but literal. Um, you're going to gather your evidence, you're going to complete what's called a form I-129, where all the questions are not obvious, or the answers rather. Now here's always a fun little bit. You have to put all your material together and then you send it to a, a performing arts union that has jurisdiction over what you're doing. Even though this has nothing to do with union uh, jurisdiction, this is all about a great, it's beautiful uh, lobbying back when the bill was done. So you pay a small extortion fee, apologies to those of you in here from unions, um, and you pay a small extortion fee, in which case they will give you a no objection letter to anyone alive. So you just say, wait, we have no objection, yeah, 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 go ahead. At which point USCIS could care less, but it's a requirement. So you send all that in, and then you pay one of two fees. You pay $460, for which they will review, the idiot will review your petition in Eh, whenever they get around to it, it depends. Right now it's around six to eight weeks, longer, shorter, you know. If you need it done more quickly, you can pay them, well, right, for a few more weeks it's 2,500, and then it's gonna go up to 2,805 at the end of February. We don't know what the extra five is for. 
Oh, it couldn't be 2800, it's gonna be 05. So I don't know if it's Staples or if they need, a, they need a new printer, but they're getting extra five bucks. So 2805 and they'll do it in 15 days. Now that means review it, not necessarily approve it. This is what you're after. If they look at it, they'll give you a coupon good for one visa. Otherwise, they'll put it on hold, send it back for what's called a request for evidence, where they will ask stupid questions. This is why you want to anticipate them up front. Uh, one of the things I always do is, just for a quick, quick example, is if you're going into an orchestra, an ensemble, um, everyone's a first, everyone's a second, everyone's a principal. Always use those terms. They believe that the first violin is only one and they won a prize, so that counts as an award. The second violin is a second place and there's only one, so that's an award. These are the kind of things that you have to think about. If you get an approval, you'll get a coupon good for one visa. Then you will go to a consulate, any consulate in the world you want. It does not have to be the consulate you're from, anywhere you can get an appointment. Um, you'll go in, you will meet a grumpy consular officer who may or may not give you a hard time, and they'll shoo you away, and then if you're not a terrorist, they will DHL you your visa, which is now good to come into the country. For most countries, these are multiple entry, come in and as much as you want. Um, again, we're going to wrap it up, but there's lots of things, for example, um, you can, yes, you can take multiple employers in an 01. Yes, you can freelance in an 01. Yes, uh, you do, you're not stuck with the petitioner. No, your school doesn't have to prove anything, you're long over with that. Um, there's lots of things you can do. Can you teach? Yes. Can you coach? Yes. Just don't say them, don't use those words because they, they, they have a whole other reason they don't like teachers. But you can call your, you can go under a faculty, just call yourself a guest artist or an artist in residence or make up something. That's what we do. A lot of it is making it up for the dumbass. Um, resources. Um, I cannot stress enough artistsfromabroad.org. It is uh, a magnificent website that is primarily done by the League of American Orchestras, for which we have the world's best and most patient uh, arts lobbyist sitting in the back row, who I encourage you all to love and adore and throw flowers at, Heather Noonan from um, the League. But also there's a whole performing arts uh, coalition involved with, with Sphinx and service centers and, and service organizations that all help maintain this site. And this site will give you samples. It will answer your questions. It will give you templates. It will do all these things. Um, to get, there are answers you can get from USCIS and the State Department's website. Just don't trust them and do not call and ask questions because that is some cat they've got answering the phone and you might as well ask the family dog. They have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> People, I call the consulate and they said, yeah, I know. I, that's whatever person was wandering by the office that day, picked it up and made up an answer. Um, Artists from Abroad is going to have your most useful stuff. We have a website where we've got free links to all kinds of things as well and questions and memos. Um, the, the correct information is out there. Your student, um, if you're students, your international affairs office can be very helpful. Um, so the correct information is out there. And that is my overview. Thank you. We have a question. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you. Very enlightening. We just saved a lot of money on a consultation fee, I feel like. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is such an important, valuable panel for so many reasons. Um, I'm also an immigrant. I'm a northern immigrant from just across the river right there. Um, but and the we keys go, on the money and you have health care and oh my god, I know, and we're, we like go, your, we're like your really obnoxious neighbors that moved <laughs> into the basement and well, you can't get rid of us. Well, um, we go through the same process. We go through exactly the same process and I came here as a student and uh, I've gone through all these different processes. I'm now the CEO of sort of a smaller nonprofit in which we are working on a variety of different um, visas. We actually acquired an H-1B visa, which was kind of miraculous, mm -hmm. denied one, which these are very expensive processes as well, so that's something that we always have to consider. My question is about O-1. Uh, is it, because H-1B, the employer must sponsor and must pay for the petition. Correct. On the O-1, I've heard conflicting responses from lawyers um, around is it the employer's responsibility to pay for the petition? I mean, I know you can almost, because there's conflicts up there that you can't, for the H-1, you, the, it, the petitioner cannot pay for it. Mm -hmm. In the O-1, what is sort of the guidelines for the O-1? The, the H-1B, and this is why I said H-1Bs are yes, complicated it's in, it's for crazy. the ARCs, because yeah. A, they require a full-time job. 
Yep. B, you have no flexibility in doing other work if you're an agent. Correct. B. And the petitioner, which must be the employer and they must pay. Correct. Everything else is completely up for grabs. Um, that you do not have to have your employer be the 01 petitioner, the employer doesn't have to pay. It's quite unusual in the US, uh, but I'm sorry, it's quite common in the US, but for other countries, for example, to somebody engage an artist and say, but you have to get your visa and you pay for everything. We're paying for nothing. Sometimes when you're booking an engagement, and a manager will get them to cover the 460, but you have to f cover everything else. But to answer your specific question, no, it's not a question at all. It, it, well, it's your question, but it's not a <laughs> conflict at all. That is just stupid answers. Only the H-1B requires you to pay. Okay. Everyone else, work it out. Okay. Totally work it out. And I have a question around artist and scholarship because you keep referencing the resistance to scholarship. Is there anything around scholarship that is, is it better for the, the people that are petitioning to leave out all their scholarship and kind of focus on their performing side? Because most artists and musicians are doing a whole range of things. Is there priorities around um, much better to highlight all your performing and all the things that bring you your Instagram account and your followers rather than looking at things where you might have been published or you might have received an award for your writing um, or would that fall into creative work that's outside the scope of musicians or who knows? There's a lot to unpack in that, but it's yeah. a good question. Um, you, you're not, if you're a musician, you can put in anything that revolves around that. So let's say you're a violist, but you've also written articles about the viola, fine. Let's say you've done dissertations about your instrument or your art form, or you're a composer, but you've also done perfectly fine, all great, anything that is related to creativity. Um, I do agree that if you have, it's, it's all about glitter. If you have fancy looking awards with certificates that would focus on that or prizes you've won, I, if I'm left with scholarship, there's, scholarship doesn't impress them. The fact that you've done a phenomenal piece of research is like um, But if you can rephrase it as a prize, if you can not call it a scholarship, say this was the international, because they don't really care what, the, what you got from it. Did you, you, know, you receive first prize from the Sphinx Scholarship Program, mm -hmm. and this is the first prize, and it's a, what is the program? It's a competition. You use the magic buzzwords. So they're looking for that and they go The key is not to have to over explain. And in general, I have found that most people are using lawyers to apply for the O-1. Mm. All these things you outline is that, that the individual can petition on their own or do you advise that you they You can't be your own petitioner. Okay, you need a lawyer. You need No, 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 no. No, oh, no, no. no. Okay. Two different things. People will go to lawyers well, for a lot of dumb reasons, but people will go to lawyers to help them navigate sure. through the process. However, Artists from Abroad is designed so an artist can do it by themselves, or an orchestra, or your organization. You, they will, you do not, they, all the lawyer does is help you prepare. So all we do, for example, is we, an organization would come to us and I'll say, let me see what, okay, I'm gonna have to put some glitter on that and sew some feathers on this and repackage that. And that's what we're doing for an artist or an organization or, but that's all the lawyer does. The lawyer does not step in place of the petitioner. If you have a student or you want to get your own 01, you can pick anyone who's gonna hire you. You can pick a friend who has an organization. You can pick, it just has to be a US uh, citizen or um, a US organization. It can't be a green card holder, but it, the sky's the limit in finding. I mean, yeah, you kind of want to, if you can find someone who's impressive, that looks good. So a lot of it is kind of, they're all kind of, uh, know, you kind of everyone's case specific as to kind of what is the most uh, glittery package you can present. Terrific. Thank, thank, thank you, you so much, Brian. Thank you for thank your you. question. So I want to remind everybody, we will take those three questions back to back. And I do want to have uh, some other questions that we have prepared for our panelists. Also, uh, please feel free to ask your questions on Slido um, because it allows us to concise, to make a very concise question. And also to remind you all that Brian and all of us will be available to speak to you all in detail after the session so you can see us outside. But please go ahead with your questions.
Thank you so much for this valuable conversation. My name is Christina and I'm a, an F1 student at Northwestern University from Bulgaria. I had a question about um, OPT and applying for O1. What does the timeline look like and when do you suggest OPT, uh, students on OPT start applying for the when O1? Do you, how, you, how do you usually deal with OPT? Uh, OPT application? No, but you are already on OPT, correct? I am not, but not. in case I apply for it after I'm done with my doctorate, and yeah. then I want to continue my work in the U.S., when would I start applying for O1? During for O1, yeah. Yes. So o o the OPT, you are eligible to apply not up to 90 days before you graduate, right? So uh, I would encourage, if OPT is really in, the, in your plans, to really apply early. Uh, the processing time is taking between four to six weeks currently. Mm -hmm. And uh, now the O1 timeline, that's... That's I, different. Yeah. I always recommend there's no reason not to do OPT if you are eligible because it's it's a free one year to do anything you want. For a lot of doctoral students, if you've only done been on an academic, I mean, a lot of PhD students who are also performing and doing other things, but if you've only done stuff in administration uh, or arts management, that's your OPT time to kind of get out of that and yes. find some reality TV show to go work for. Um, so, so they will get impressed. But, but just for context, OPT is a work authorization that international students are eligible to apply for once they graduate. What is your area of study? Violent performance. Okay, so in that case you have, uh, if, if approved, it's one year work authorization. However, if you are in a STEM field, uh, you have up to uh, three years of OPT. A lot of our master's students at Berkeley, all of our master's program, they are eligible, they qualify as STEM majors, and our students can work without any kind of additional application up to three years. So just like employers in the room, just keep that in mind. Yeah, I guess a Thank part, you. the main part of my question. Thank you, we need to, okay. we need well, to keep uh, it up, and then we'll be able to speak to you afterwards. I will, I will give you a question. You can apply up to, for an 01 up to a year in advance and when you want it to Got start. It. So you could get your OPT and start working on it at the exact same time if Got you it. wanted to. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Let's take the next two questions back to back, please. Sure. Mine is concise. Thank you. Um, my name is Sarah Vanderplug, and I work for a Pathways program in Chicago. A handful of the students I work with are dreamers, and is there anything I can do to help them as they're looking to do advanced summer study and applying for top music schools? I wish I had a good answer for that one. Um, the U.S. government's the U.S. government. It all depends on the administration. It all depends on who's making, those are all very political issues, which, um, I mean, actually Heather can tell you more about that in the back there. Um, she, she deals with how, again, how, it's a very congressional, it's, it's all mixed. There's no official thing for them to do without leaving the U.S. Mm -hmm. and applying from the outside, that's the official, what they want, but that has, as you know, that's gonna just blow everything up, which is why they want them to do that. Yeah. So I'm sorry, Thank I, I don't have any really good answer for that one. Hi, uh, one quick question. For OPT, do I have to have the job secured before applying to it? No. No. Okay. Also, I'm a Fulbright, is that considered a prize? Yes. Oh, awesome. Yes, it is a prize. Okay, and then the, um, so does artists from abroad uh, include arts administrators too? I think it does. I mean, it should um, because it all they all tie in. It can be a little bit more tricky for arts administrators because you have to show them that you had a critical role in what you're doing. So usually what I do for that is just take out the word intern, make up titles. We get people to say she was, you know, she was, you know, you may have been sim not simply because it's important, but, you know, cross-referencing, you know, uh, donor lists when now that becomes an assistant coordinator of special events and fundraising, you know, things like that. <laughs> um, but that's where if they want you, the employer needs to also join in this theatrical dance. So that's where they can help. Thank you. Thank you. Now I have a question, uh, or I have a question for the panel and to share with you all. If you're a student in, um, in Andrea's case, how to market yourself and how to convince your potential employer, how to convince an employer to, to, to petition you. So can you tell us, Andrea, how, how did you get the Empire State Youth Orchestra to you know, hire you, agree to sponsor your visa, and now to also be at the level of uh, applying for your green card? So I, I started thinking about that when I was in my undergraduate. 
So I thought, okay, I'm, I'm gonna get as much e education as possible so that um, my employer sees that I am very valuable. And so I got my undergraduate degree in performance and then a master's degree in cello performance. And then I thought, okay, maybe performance is gonna be, um, it's gonna be difficult for me to get a no one. So I'm gonna get a, a degree, a master's degree in arts administration so that they, the employer sees, okay, she can play an instrument, but as well she can, uh, she's an arts administrator. So you have this, I'm gonna have more chances. And then, well, I also speak Spanish, so that's beneficial to them at least. And as, as many things as I could do during my studies, um, go to this music festival to do this internship as uh, orchestra manager and then another one to be a music librarian and, as, and acquire as much uh, experience as possible. And then <clears throat> when I uh, graduated, I thought, okay, I'm gonna get my OPT and then it's gonna be uh, um, an organization that for me, I thought it's, it, it needs to be small for me so that they know me better. and. These big organizations, they have so many employers and it's very hard for them to notice you, but in a small organization, they can notice you. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna be uh, with an organization with OPT and then maybe they can, after a couple of months of them seeing that I was a very good worker, um, employer, uh, employee, sorry, um, then uh, they can sponsor my visa and that's what I, what I did. I did my best and then I asked them, could you please sponsor my visa? And then they said yes, and then there was the extension, and then now the green card. So it's just methodical. Thank you. Right. Thank you. And again, if we have some questions on Slido, we will have some time for a Q&A. But now I have another question for, um, in terms of the universities, um, it's very expensive from what I've heard to be an international student. So not only you know, do we need to you know, get some jobs on the side, get you know, a Sphinx touring performance opportunity so that we can pay for it, and at the same time, our families are sometimes helping us pay for that tuition. So what are the what's the university's role in here in terms of, yes, giving us great training, great credentials, advising us on the next steps, but also being real about the challenges that we will all experience um, as we pursue an, a career in the arts tw uh, and twice as hard as an international artist in the arts. Yeah. Uh that's absolutely true. Everybody who comes to study in the U.S., they spend a small fortune to be here. Um, I, I see some heads nodding there, yes. Um, unless you have a full scholarship, which is not very common. Now, you mentioned getting a job on the side. Please don't work without authorization. That is the most severe violation of status that uh, a student can have as an F1 student. Uh, if I as a designated school official have evidence that a student has worked without authorization, I am required to terminate their immigration record. So uh, please, uh, when you think about getting a job on the side, uh, make sure you learn the right ways to do that. Okay, so talk to your international office. They, they want to help you find ways to do that. Um, so, it's, it's very interesting how universities work, uh, in, and it doesn't matter if they're big or small, they're often uh, somewhat decentralized, and there are the silos where people don't talk very often. So part of my job is to go from department to department to talk about work authorization, when students can work, what kind of requirements exist for us to approve curricular practical training, which is work authorization that happens uh, as a consequence of a degree requirement that exists as part of the, the program. Uh, and as much as I go around and I talk to people about this and I explain this and we have information published on our website, newsletters, I still meet everyday faculty who have never heard uh, what this is and how it works. So with universities, uh, if you're a student, think about uh, learn about this, learn about that, and so you can a little bit advocate for yourself. So you can talk to uh, 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 chairs, uh, de uh, deans, associate deans, who are looking, and they have information about possible uh, opportunities that uh, you can engage with that will look like 
uh, not a school opportunity that you could use, potentially use for uh, a visa application. So um, career services, they often work with students as well to find these opportunities. So at Berkeley, uh, currently, we have a very strong partnership and we are finding creative ways to uh, be able to approve work authorization for students based on CPT. So we have Career Services created an internship class that students can register for so we can, you know, once the opportunity fulfills the requirements, we can approve that so students can have this, the chance to go, for example, to uh, Los Angeles and perform or participate in a recording on whatever it is they want to do. I just to underscore one thing because it's so important is whatever advice you get, go back to this international student office because you said something that really resonated, which is your professors and your other departments are extraordinarily well-meaning, but will give you all, I've had so many situations where a professor has said, oh, you don't need a visa for this. Right. This is the school. Yeah. Oh, you know, and then the international affairs office is stuck because that was wrong. And it's like, but the professor told me, but yeah. the professor doesn't know that. And a lot of students have found themselves in a difficult situation because, well, my, my coach, my professor told me I could go and do this. And only this office really keeps up on those rules. Well, and sometimes there isn't an, an immediate consequence to that activity. Sometimes the consequence comes in the future when you're applying for other benefits. So you're applying for OPT, and then they might find out that, uh, oh, you, you played in this concert this day and you didn't have CPT for that, how come, right? And then OPT denied. We've had this happen uh, before. Of course, that depends on whether you were dumb enough to list that in your application. But in your OPT application? Yeah, I can talk about that. Also. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, um, Career services, they tend to help. So go talk to folks in your school and, and learn about that, learn about these opportunities. The other thing that is often overlooked is study abroad. Study, because international students are already studying abroad, so why would they want to go to yet another country uh, to study? But in our case, we have a campus in Valencia, Spain, and it's an outstanding opportunity for students, one, because they, in, in Boston, they can't find uh, time to book a studio uh, because we have so many students and it's so limited. In Spain, they can get you know two hours once a week for the whole time they are there. So, but, but in addition to that, they're studying in a different country. The work authorization laws that we have here, they don't apply anymore and they can do all sorts of different activities. They have the chance to participate uh, and we provide this exp like uh, participation in different uh, uh, concerts and different uh, um, different academic uh, activities that, as you said, they don't have to look like an academic activity. It can just yeah. simply look like you worked at that uh, uh, festival, you performed, and now you have that in your in your CV. So that's it, that's an idea as well. Yeah. And on the side cost of living in Spain is much lower than in Boston, so actually you go to Spain and you save some money compared to studying in Boston. Thank you, thank you, Roberto. And I wanted to follow up on the question uh, regarding dreamers and supporting you know, undocumented students. Uh, it, it, that's, that's, that's part of the work that I do, so perhaps we can advocate for an immigration reform and bring awareness to our elected officials, to our senators to say, this is our large population. We are an important organization in this town. Help us with our constituents. And you know, the Dreamers movement took a while, but they got some. You know, a few Dreamers were able to get some um, some support, and now you know we're we're really advocating for those that were not supported. So I also just want to mention that out there that the whole immigration system is is difficult in the United States, but we can be advocates for those that are not in the, you know, academic, in these academic opportunities or positions. Um, it's now, another way of saying, please vote. <clears throat> exactly, yeah, please get the vote out. Um, I have another question, um, and in terms of how do employers, or what advice do you have, Brian, for, for me or for other organizations here that are listening as well, that 
it's, you know, if someone applies, I've gotten a lot of applications for a uh, managerial role, mm -hmm. and they do say, I will need you to sponsor my visa. So when we have a hiring committee, the hiring committee is just, no, like we don't know that, and we don't have a legal advisor on our board, or so, you know, we don't know how much we're gonna pay, we're already gonna make this big effort by hiring another full-time role. So how do you advise us to, to think this through and, and, and find, some, find some ways to still make it happen? Well, I mean, and sadly, a lot of organizations, including um, uh, uh, like training programs and things, are also starting to condition their approvals on whether or not, you know, there's some that I work with who will come down to the final applicants and they'll send them to our office to say, do we think we can, you can, we can get the work authorization, otherwise we won't accept them into the program. That's devastatingly horrible uh, to have to do it that way. What I usually say is what makes it, there are some, there are many employers out there who are more than happy to work with you, although they may not do the work. However, another thing I always talk about is if you're, as, a, as an applicant, as a, we call the beneficiary, as the non-US performer, you can backdoor it by finding a way to, okay, do you qualify for no one? Okay, yes. Now, can you find somebody willing to be your petitioner? Maybe it's, an, if you're in artist management, there's an artist who will hire you to manage them. Okay, fine, could be your friend, doesn't matter. Or there's a quartet, or that, you know, I put in things where I've got eight members of a quartet, they don't know. They can be the fourth person of a trio, they don't know. Um, the idea is, if you set up an 01, or what they call an itinerary-based 01, where you have multiple employers, you are then free to take on anything you want or cancel it. So, if you've got an itinerary-based 01 set up, then they can go to you, and that's not even on the table for you guys, because it's like, yeah, you can take any work they want, but done. So finding a way to get something before, you know, so they're not, you're not necessarily going, uh, killing your own opportunity by saying, hi, um, I'm great, but you're going to need to spend a time and a fortune to work with me. And this is how a lot, if also for performing artists, this makes being able to take work in the U.S. when someone falls off the orchestra pit and they need you the next day, this is your golden ticket because managers will want to work with you if you have the ability to take on multiple jobs. You'll have much more people willing to not even look into that. It's tricky. Um, and again, I keep hate to keep going back to it, but artists from abroad can also explain more about that. Thank you. We have a question from the chat. What is the best visa option for an arts administrator? Could you give advice as to who to talk to about visa sponsorship when applying for jobs? Well, <clears throat> if you're fortunate enough to be able to find an H-1B position where somebody is willing to give you a full-time job and pay for all the costs, that's ideal. The problem with that, as you probably encountered, is that there are, in addition to the payments and fees, it's much more expensive than the O-1. And the, your employer has to pay a minimum salary as determined arbitrarily by the U.S. government and then or sort of explain why or why not that doesn't apply. The O-1 for anyone in the arts is always your, my first thing to explore if there's any way to try and do it because it's your most flexibility. Um, it opens up the most doors for you to do multiple different things at one time. There's so many advantages. It's like the best thing to getting a green card without the green card, because you really can do anything you want. Um, I, for the other part was who you talk to about sponsors. I'm not sure I understood that one. Um, could you give advice as to who to talk to about visa sponsorship when applying for the jobs? The person you're applying, I, I guess the, there isn't, your, the, the, a sponsor is really not, it's a confusing word because that's for family. A petitioner is a person who is employing you. So if you are implying, applying for an arts management position, that's when you would also talk to them about, you know, will you also, if you bring me, would you be willing to help me with the visa process? This goes back to your question where some people might say, mm -hmm. so at this, that time you might be more attractive to say, if you hire me, I can deal with this on my own. 
which means then finding somebody else to be your petitioner. And anybody can, as long as they're engaging you to do something. So it could, again, not to keep saying a broken record, but this is where you get creative. This is where you find a teeny tiny small thing. Or I have a lot of, uh, of arts managers or uh, students who will find a job at a small music school and they'll be the petitioner that will allow them to do because one petitioner can put multiple employees on their on, on, on their on your petition. So you can say, hi, I'm stepping forward to petition for her to do this as well as this and this and that and that, and you can round them all up into one big petition. What are your question? Hello, uh, my name is Chiara. I work for a mu music pathway program in Philadelphia. My question is for um, universities in the United States. Um, you mentioned that getting a job off-site is illegal. We should not be doing that. I'm a former international student um, uh, that is not directly related to your field of studies. And then when you do enroll, you're an international student, you do enroll in the class um, that allows you to work in your field and you're lucky enough to find a job um, in the arts that is re directly related, you're approved and everything goes well. Um, you can only work 20 hours uh, a week and unless you have, in some university, I'm not sure if it's everywhere, but uh, you can only work, if you have a TA ship, you can only work the remainder of the hours. So uh, not if you're working five hours for your universities to cover your scholarship, your tuition, then you can only work 15 hours off-site. Um, this, uh, um, in my perspective, um, excludes a, a lot of students that cannot afford to um, pay 20, 30, 40 thousand dollars a year room and board and then work 20 hours a week. That's probably four or five hundred dollars a month. Um, that covers your groceries. If you live in New York City, that covers your electric bill. <laughs> um, so uh, I think this excludes a huge part of the population uh, that cannot just afford it because our parents, you know, are lower middle class. Um, do you, how do you see this changing and is this even part of the conversation to make it more accessible um, to part of the population, again, that um, is not able to um, afford all the costs as international students? I don't see this changing, okay. it's unfortunately. A, it's I, I, I'm going to, if you, if you I, I hate to keep saying to Heather. Heather, can you wave your arm in the back there? Okay. Um, Heather, this is a lobbying issue, and this is a really great thing to talk to Heather about um, because she, again, is tirelessly at, up on Capitol Hill, banging her head against the wall. The U.S. is not known for being a very magnanimous country when it comes to why don't we just help people and be reasonable. So it is, do I see this happening? It's a political hot potato. Nobody wants to be the one who says, let's make it easier. They all don't get along, they all hate each other. I agree, I don't see this changing much, but I know the conversations are happening all the time. I know that you know it's like a negotiation where you ask for a bazillion things and we hope to get a little bit. There are many senators and congressmen who are very sympathetic, but limited in what they can do. Um, it's purely a lobbying effort, and I would encourage you to be part of that effort, effort in every way you possibly can. Voices do help. Um, Thank you. We have a question on Slido. If, a, if I have a spouse, is it better to apply with them from the beginning or add them as a dependent later? For, a, for an OPT visa or obviously it's on Slido? There was no specification, okay. so. Um, I'm not sure what they're asking, but let me just answer it this way. Um, if you are applying for an O-1, for example, you, your spouse is eligible for an O-3. It does not allow them to work in the U.S., but allows them to live here. Um, all of the performing are the, the only dependent type of, of immigration document that would allow a dependent to work would be the green card process. I'm and sure. yes, you want to do all of that at one time. Okay. And there is no other dependent in the other things we're talking about. There is no mechanism for a a dependent to work at, who's a spouse or a child of a performing artist or someone in the arts. We just not set up that way. Sorry, there's a bunch of questions, so I'm just going to do another one from online. If it's an unpaid gig, does it count as work or can it be considered a volunteer activity? Does it work against you in an O-1 solicitation? That's a great question, and that comes back, why would you tell them any of that? 
Oh. It's all about, no, we don't use words like cover. We don't use words like intern, but you take all of that out because they don't only know what you tell them. They do not do independent research. They do not go online. So yeah, I'm always saying, no, don't just don't say that. You know, you're not a cover role. You performed Mimi. Well, I only did the matinee. Okay, fine. This was volunteered. How did they know that? This is all about smoke and glitter and feathers and sequins. Thank you so much, Brian. This has been really, really enlightening. Uh, we do have one minute to wrap it up. So if it's possible to take your last question um, outside, please. And I just want to ask our panelists to please give us some parting thoughts, some action items that we all, you all can take uh, tomorrow or effective next week when we get back to our places um, or when we get back to the, you know, outside of the virtual um, connectors here that we can do to either get more information to pursue the next, you know, chapter in our lives or to support and embrace um, as an employer being, you know, willing to consider uh, international students. So just parting advice and actionable items. I, I just wanted to say that my, my goal was, well, I would have liked to see more organizations here because I wanted to, for them to see that although it's, it is expensive, um, it is worth it because international students in general are very grateful and we work very hard and I wanted to say that and so that we get hired. Uh, but I also thought, why, if, why doesn't it see something like SOPA, like the auditions, but for arts administrators where um, organizations come and then you pitch to them and then can you please pay for my, no I'm kidding, just <laughs> hire me please. So yeah, that was my goal. But Thank you. Very brief, uh, don't get advice from colleagues and equally confused friends, go to artismabroad.org. My, my advice is for employees in the room, learn about the OPT authorization, learn about CPT, learn about all these processes because uh, you might be missing out the opportunity to hire amazing people uh, because we don't have enough information. Thank you, and my advice to everybody is to just learn and um, become, become familiar with everything that's happening from an immigration standpoint here in the United States, you know, the work with immigrant children, how that influences our work at the local, you know, the local schools and the local sector. Learn about the importance of advocacy and the power that we all can have with our elected officials and show them that, hey, we pay taxes, you work for us, you don't, we don't work for you. So just really important to learn about the, the importance of advocacy in the arts. So thank you all so much. We'll be taking any other questions outside and thank you for joining virtually. Have a good day.